so I think the topic of this talk is guidance for training. And when I was thinking about it, uh, I knew that in the audience, we would have medical students, we would have uh, trainees, and we would have master surgeons as well. So I wanted to sort of parallel this talk and speak to everyone here. And hopefully, uh, you know, I will we'll have accomplished that by the end of this talk, and you'll, you'll find it interesting. So, so the title of my talk is From Training to Practice, Perspectives on Learning and Teaching. Um, when I first, um, you know, came to practice after my training, I always, uh, and during my training too, I always asked myself, what motivates a surgeon? And so there's a lot of things that come to mind, you know, that includes obviously the patient, the, the welfare, welfare and the idea of altruism. There's a sense of community, a sense of duty to this profession. There's a satisfaction that's derived from teaching and many people go into uh, clinical practice to teach the next generation as well. Um, there's obviously the technical challenge and overcoming that that motivates a surgeon, um, mastery and competence, uh, autonomy, and you know to be honest, oftentimes there are people who are motivated from from financial incentives too. But what I think we would all agree is what we really motivates us is the 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 help that patients need, uh, and and that really drives us. And so this quote comes to mind: We all strive to be the best. Um, I wanted to share this quote that you, you may have um, uh, you know, read about in, in the book, When Breath Becomes Air by Dr. Kalanthi. He was a neurosurgery uh, a resident and then uh, an attending at Stanford. And he was diagnosed with cancer during training and unfortunately passed away um, after he uh, you, you know, um, uh, completed his training. In his book, he wrote, you can't, you can't ever reach perfection, but you can believe in an asymptote toward which you are ceaselessly striving. And you know, this quote can be applied to us as trainees, as well as um, us as teachers as well, once we have completed training, and it's something to, to live by, really. So during my practice, I always, you know, ask myself, how do you define uh, a successful neurosurgeon? You know, in America, we have this quote, the three A's, availability, affability, and ability. Um, we define ourselves by our patient outcomes. We can define ourselves by the relationships we have with our patients and their families. Um, certainly, um, resident teaching, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, other types of people that we can teach in the medical field, including physician assistants, nurse practitioners, nurses, and students. Um, and, and this really leaves a legacy. Um, what also defines us as, as successful neurosurgeons are our academic accomplishments and our participation in organized neurosurgery, our publications, and contribu contributions to literature. Uh, but again, I would say, I would argue that the most important thing is how we treat our patients and what their outcomes are. And so, does that translate to technical ability? I would argue that it probably does. And so the next you know, logical question is, well, how, do you, how, does one, how is one surgeon better than another? And how is technical ability um, um, uh, sought after? And so this is a, a, a publication from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013. Um, they sought, these authors sought to, to understand the relationship between a surgeon's operative technique and patient outcomes. So they looked at 20 bariatric surgeons in Michigan and they, each of these surgeons submitted how they did a gastric bypass. So they're a total of about 10,000 uh, patients and each video was rated in the domains of technical skills. And what they saw uh, was that the bottom quartile of, of the surgeons who were scored that way had higher complications, a higher mortality, longer operations and higher rates of reoperation. And so there was an inverse relationship between um, surgical skill and um, uh, and, the, and in terms of how they were graded uh, and their complication rate. And so some of the things that these videos looked at were the gentleness on the tissue, timing and motion, instrument handling, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to quickly just show you a video uh, of a so-called high-rated surgeon. So you can see that the, there's a very economy of motion. They're, they're um, uh, picking up the tissue um, and they have um, you know a goal in mind, very quickly accomplishing the tasks at hand without trauma. And this was, uh, the video on the right was a lower rated surgeon. You can see it's a little bit slower um, and cautious um, and uh, multiple steps in order to achieve a goal. Um, the tissue was more traumatic, etc. cetera. And, and so, so then the next logical question is, well, how do you become an expert? Um, and how do you achieve that technical ability? And so a, lo a lot of factors come to mind. That includes natural talent, your instinct, the attitude, critical thinking, circumstance, environment, timing, 
uh, intelligence and the concept of deliberate practice. And um, the, what I want to talk more about now is deliberate practice. This was also mentioned by uh, Dr. Saman, one of his colleagues earlier this morning. Um, there was a, a scientist, uh, uh, Herbert Simon and, uh, and William Chase, uh, who published a paper regarding what grandmasters, what made chess players basically grandmasters. And, and this is really where the concept of the 10,000, so-called 10,000 hour rule to become an expert came from, from chess players. And so, as I mentioned, it's been, it's been suggested that 10,000 hours are, are required as practice. Um, Eric, uh, excuse me, Anderson Erickson, who was a psychologist, coined the term 10,000 hours um, and really uh, uh, talked about the, the idea of deliberate practice and the quality of practice, which was defined as a high concentration beyond one's comfort zone. This is one, this is one of the articles, the original articles, that sort of um, looked at uh, violin players um, in terms of how much they trained in terms of hours. And the, what they found was at the age of eight, practice times began to diverge. And elite performers were, were really practicing greater than 10,000 plus hours, which was double the uh, amount of less capable performers. Um, uh, similarly, another article stated that um, this, uh, that the strongest predictor of chess skill um, was deliberate practice, um, and they, they expended about 5,000 hours or more. And so someone earlier mentioned the uh, deliberate practice in the, in the book Outliers. This really popularized the concept um, in, 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 uh, in uh, our society by Malcolm Gladwell, who, who talked about the 10,000 hour rule. And I'll touch upon that later. Certainly there's also studies that, that suggest otherwise, that it's not necessarily deliberate practice that explains the variance between various specialties. Um, so you then ask, well, if it's not deliberate practice, what, what does explain that variance? And other thoughts can include age, general intelligence, and working memory as well. So logically, well, how do you define intelligence? That's the next question. Many, many people have tried uh, or, or have successfully defined it, uh, you know, early on from the 1900s and more recently, Binet and Simon in 19, 1905 really um, defined it as the ability to judge well, to understand well and to reason well. And um, uh, they are the ones that really came up with the, the IQ uh, tests. Um, it was the first time that the concept of IQ was used, and, and the definition, as you can, as you can see, is mental age over chronological age uh, times by 100. There have been other studies since then that tried to validate the IQ study, and in fact, um, some of these papers were, were, had com completely fabricated results, yet we, we still use the concept of IQ as, as intelligence. Uh, more recently, Gardner, who is a Harvard a psychologist, um, came up with the theory of multiple intelligences, uh, explaining, um, um, uh, you know, how to become an expert. And this this really um, became one of the evolution uh, was the evolution in terms of how American education has um, uh, evolved. And so the concept of multiple intelligences include, you know, having good interpersonal skills, um, um, body uh, kinesthetic strength. Mus musicians, verbal linguistic skills, logical mathematical skills, uh, et cetera. Um, this is sort of a more simple version. You know, you think of mathematical geniuses, you think of Isaac Newton, linguistics and Shakespeare, uh, musical and Mozart and so on. So what about surgeons? Um, I think when we think of surgeons, um, it is a combination of all these types of intelligence that, that, that we need in order to get the task done. And that includes being good teachers. Um, so what is surgical intelligence? Back to Malcolm Gladwell, he looked at um, uh, three people in his piece, Physical Genius. Um, Wayne Gretzky, who's a Canadian um, hockey player, Yo-Yo Ma, who uh, was a famous musician, and Charlie Wilson, who you may have heard of as a neurosurgeon who uh, was the chair of neurosurgery at UCSF. And, and he really tried to study the three of them. And what, what, um, what, what he found out was is sort of a pyramid in terms of the skills they needed. They had their technical skills, they practiced, they practiced, and then they also had this concept of imagination in terms of rehearsing what they needed to do to get the task done. And, and I, I want to read this quote um, that, uh, that Charlie Wilson had said, sometimes during the course of an operation, there will be several possible ways of doing something, and I'll size them up, and without having any conscious reason, I'll just do one of them. 
it's sort of an invisible hand he went on. It begins almost to seem mystical. So this, you know, I don't know what to make of this quote completely because because you make it, you know, he seems to make it something beyond just himself, which perhaps in a way it is, but ultimately we do have control over our actions. So Gladwell argued that like Gretzky and Wilson, they all had an affinity to translate thought into action. And the Harvard University psychologist Coslin, um, you know, studied this as well and felt that people who, who, who complete tasks do it in different stages, uh, who, who complete tasks really well. And so those stages include image generation, which um, works on long-term memory and re reconstruction of what the task needs to be done, image inspection, mental picture and drawing and inferences, image maintenance, holding the picture steady, and image transformation, manipulating that image. And we all do that as surgeons, especially as neurosurgery, when we look at uh, MRI scans and tumors and how we get the best approach, we, 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 we manipulate those images in our mind to try to get um, the, the best surgical approach possible and ultimately the best surgical outcome. Um, Bosk uh, at the University of Pennsylvania was a so sociologist and he was um, interested in looking at neurosurgery residents who ended up resigning or were fired. And what he found was that the neurosurgery residents who um, answered the question, have you ever made a mistake? When they answered the question saying, well, I, I don't think I really have, uh, or you know, I had bad outcomes, but it was for X, Y, and Z reason versus those residents who answered the question, I made mistakes all the time. It was horrible. I thought about it a lot. It made me change my practice. What he found was that uh, successful surgeons are those that are mentally prepared for failure. Beyond technical skills or intelligence, the attitude of a surgeon makes a difference. And um, those, surgeon, those residents that completed training had a practical-minded obsession with the possibility and consequence of failure. And so I think it's important to remember that. Obviously, we all want to succeed, but there are times where, where, where failure does happen or patients have bad outcomes, and we have to learn from them. That's really the key to success. And so there was a Harvard Business Review, a three-part series that, that's relevant to neurosurgery, because again, it looked at experts in fields. So Michael Jordan, who you may have heard of, a very um, uh, a great basketball player. When you look at him, he was actually cut from his high school basketball team. Charlie Wilson, a uh, famous neurosurgeon, was fired from his first neurosurgery job um, at Louisiana State. We look at companies and industries, Honda, um, the low powered mo motorcycle, which was originally known for, tanked in America, yet uh, look at them now. You have um, uh, Folkman, who was uh, a physician that was ridiculed for his work on angiogenesis and, and tumors, yet um, that is um, a big portion in terms of treatment of cancers. Apple's uh, Macintosh computer, Lisa, um, um, failed, but now Apple is, uh, we all have iPhones, right? It's, its market cap is you know, over a trillion dollars. So how do you become an expert? I think it's an ongoing debate among psychologists. There's multiple factors, factors that we all talked about. I don't think there's one uh, answer that simply explains becoming an expert, uh, but the answer lies in between all these factors. So a lot of people um, have asked me, like coming from America, like how is neurosurgical training and what is it like? So I wanted to just briefly go through that. So there's 80 hours per week, we have a, a maximum in, tra in training. We have 49 weeks three we of, of work, three weeks of vacation per year. So my training was six years, so that's 23,000 hours. Uh, now the system is such that it's seven years, so when you calculate that out, it's close to 30,000 hours. But really, how much is focused on one task? When we talk about you know chess players and musicians and the 10,000 hour rule, we're spending 27,000 hours doing multiple things. So are we really becoming experts in training? Um, these, these are uh, our, our, our council that um, regulate the, uh, the training and they have minimum required. So in 2016, you can see in order to graduate residency or training, you have to have a certain number of cases. So when you look at cranial cases, roughly 200, spinal cases, roughly 95, pediatric cases, 30, um, and different types of bedside procedures or operative procedures, uh, 90. Um, and this is a list of sort of the average um, amount of cases that a neurosurgery resident in America trains, completes. And when you look at the end, it's, it's roughly about um, 1,300 or so cases. 
Um, recently, these case log numbers changed, uh, more so uh, the vascular numbers. Uh, as you can imagine, vascular uh, neurosurgery is increasingly t uh, Particularly, uh, and open surgery volume probably has gone down, and so uh, the the minimum requirements have changed uh, as well. Um, so, looking at just my residency case volume as an example, um, by the time I graduated in six years, I had done close to 1,500 cases, probably split between cranial and spine evenly. We did pediatric cases and a, and a combination of everything in between. I subsequently went for fellowship for a pediatric uh, training. I did about 400 or so cases. Again, a mix of everything. Um, so I, I also wanted to share uh, with you where I work because um, of the importance of teaching um, and, and it goes along with guidance for, 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 for uh, training. So I, uh, now I work at UVA, there's 14 neurosurgeons, 24 residents, six of these residents go to the NIH for their training. Uh, you can see in this picture, the faculty and residents, uh, probably a lot of you recognize Chris Shaffrey in the back here, he's now at Duke. Uh, his brother, Mark Shaffrey is a chair. Um, this has been the theme since I've been there in my, in my job. And it's our residents are the jewels of the neurosurgery program. And that really has been the motto since I've been there. Patient care becomes number one, but after that, everything has been um, in relation to the, the, the residents and the trainees. And I would argue that there's two legacies that we as neurosurgeons can lead. One is how we treat our patients and two, the people that we train that carry on this legacy. And, and that's why um, when we, we, we talk about guidance for, for, for training, um, it's really important for us to, to hold or give emphasis to the fact uh, of teaching. So just a few things about this, um, you know, as, as uh, attendings, as consultants, um, when, we, when we teach medical students, when we teach our, our residents, um, our job is to ensure that every trainee has acquired both the knowledge and the skill necessary to practice neurosurgery. And we have to encourage the development of professional competence through feedback and collegial support. Feedback is, is definitely critical and something that is even more and more in the US, and I'll, I'll talk about that more, but there's very different ways of providing feedback. You need positive feedback, negative feedback, uh, each of them have their pluses and minuses. And part of our job is to learn how, how our trainees, you know, how their personality is and, and individualize this feedback as well. Um, everyone, I, I feel like, loves to teach. And so we, we should also encourage our trainees to become teacher, teachers as well and foster those skills. Um, we have to emphasize resident wellness and recognize burnout um, because burnout can have implications to patient care and personal and mental health as well. Uh, the concept of leadership is important as well. You know, there are leaders that, that lead by fear versus respect, but I think that um, the majority of us would probably um, agree that respect, if you respect someone, you're going to do things for them because you don't want to disappoint them. And so as, as uh, trainers for trainees, we have to remember this concept as well. So what makes a good clinical teacher? There's obviously, you have to be an expert in your field, right? Because you need to teach uh, the, the, the trainees. So clinical knowledge, clinical and technical competence, a positive relationship with trainees, effective communication and enthusiasm we talked about. So I wanted to uh, just uh, briefly mention the types of feedback we give um, in, in our program. We have uh, twice yearly meetings with each uh, of the uh, uh, residents, but after every surgical case, every, after every operative case, there's an app that you all can download called Simple, System for Improving and Measuring Procedural Learning. And um, this, this app was uh, validated through studies in terms of how feedback um, um, improves uh, resident education. And really it's just three quick questions that you can um, fill out, you know, when you're finished with a case and going to change your clothes or, or go to clinic, it's very, it takes, you know, maybe a minute. And the, really the question is how much guidance did you receive for the majority of the critical portion of this procedure? So you're, you're uh, giving feedback to the, the, the trainee. The next question is how complex was the case relative to similar procedures? And the third is please rate your performance for this case. Uh, from unprepared to clinically deficient to exceptional performance. And then there's a dictation where you quickly hit the button and say, hey, um, Maren, you did a great job opening. Um, you can improve by anticipating the next steps in surgery. Um, the, the tumor section went great. However, you can work on hemostasis. So these are important things to, to give feedback on a daily basis so you can see improvements over time. 
So transitioning to what they don't teach you, you know, a lot of people would come up to me and say, hey, you're in practice now. What, what didn't you learn as, a, as, as, a, as an attending uh, in, in residency? So we often don't talk about navigating political culture in the workplace. Um, and that can be important, especially for, for people transitioning from, from training to practice. Um, oftentimes when you go out to the community, people ask, well, what do you do? You really have to have an answer and, and plan for building your practice. It's always important to have a mentor um, that, can, that can help you at all steps in your career. Um, I was told this when I first started to work, don't try to hit home runs, just make it to the base first. Um, you always have to think about what the appropriations are for surgery. You know, watch surgeries, learn from, sur from other people, ask questions unrelentingly, record your own surgeries and, and, and view them afterwards to see how you can improve, just like we were looking at the videos uh, in, the, in the first uh, couple slides. The past experience come through subconsciously. You know, you'll remember um, what your, um, your, your uh, consultant, your attending uh, tells you years from now in terms of uh, cases, understanding and taking ownership of complications. And then what's really important, I think probably even more so in developing countries is how to balance hyper-specialization in the general practice of neurosurgery. Um, you know, it's always important, never get angry, communicate effectively, recognize your limitations, always maintain a database. Um, and you can look into that when, when you're ready to write publications and contribute to the literature. As I mentioned, record surgeries. Confidence versus humility. It's very important in terms of um, being a surgeon and being a teacher as well. It's always okay to say, I don't know, but let me think about that to patients and to trainees. Um, and, and as we mentioned, uh, rehearsing surgeries, you know, prior to actually performing them, you know, in your mind. So is confident humility possible? Um, it's always a balance. Uh, you know, it's very important for surgeons to be confident, but at the same time, you have to be humble as well. And so um, when we look at um, being a surgeon teacher, you have to be confident, you know, we strive for perfectionism, we take risks, we have to let go of failures in order to, to continue, um, you know, making progress. Um, we have to accept compliments, but at the same time, it's important to be humble. It's okay to say, I don't know. Uh, it's okay to share your mistakes and learn from them and, and, and let others learn from them as well, to see different viewpoints and reframe your view from me to we. Um, you know, we talked about Henry Marsh. Um, it's a great book, uh, uh, Admissions and Do No Harm, in terms of um, training, becoming um, outside of tr uh, training, and then and, and leading others as well. Uh, this One of my um, attendings always would say this to us. It takes five years to develop a practice, 10 years to develop a reputation, and only 30 seconds to screw it up. Um, and that can come from, you know, you're doing some, some harm to patients or even, you know, talking to your, 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 the OR uh, scrub tech or the nurse in a wrong manner or, or, or your, your residents in a wrong manner. It's always important to keep that in mind. Um, when I came out, I, I'm going to end with this. When I came out of the practice, uh, when I started practice, excuse me, the end of my training, um, a lot of the chief residents who were graduating after me would, would call me and say, hey, you know, you're out in practice. How did you feel? Like, how was it? And so I, I created this graph, actually, because it really summarizes, at least to me, the internal struggles of a neurosurgeon. When you're starting out in training, you know, your confidence is a little low. You're trying to figure out and learn and what you do. But as you progress, you get more and more confident because you have the education that's necessary. As a chief resident, you're probably on a high because you feel like you can do everything. You know, maybe you start fellowship and, and you dip a little low because you're learning from other people and maybe you don't know those skill sets yet. But by the time you start your job, you feel, you feel great. And then you have your first case and, and you feel the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the responsibility you have, you don't have anyone backing you up and, and, and then you have good outcomes and bad outcomes. And, you know, as you advance along your career, your confidence continues to grow. Thank you.